hello, this is Christine Elder and uh, Lisa Sorensen from Birds Caribbean, and we're going to be teaching you all about barn owls today and their biology and anatomy and their distribution, and mostly how to sketch them. So, uh, Lisa, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about Birds Caribbean? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for joining us. I am Lisa Sorensen. I'm the executive director of Birds Caribbean. And this um, fall, throughout September, October, and into November, we are celebrating World Migratory Bird Day. And this is celebrated all over the world, actually, and um, in the Americas, and also in, well, in the tropics and Southern Hemisphere, we tend to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day in the fall because this is when all the migrants are heading south and we like to say they're returning home. So we've got a big influx of migrants coming to stay for the winter and then some are just passing through, stopping over to rest and refuel on their long migrations. Um, in the US and Canada, World Migratory Bird Day is often celebrated in the spring because of course, um, beautiful breeding birds are returning home to nest. So you can celebrate Bird Day whenever you want. Um, we encourage you to visit this website to learn more about it and um, download some helpful resources to, to help you celebrate. Great. Okay, and then just a little bit more about Birds Caribbean. We are a regional nonprofit and we are dedicated to conserving birds and nature in all of the islands of the Caribbean. So we work with our partners on um, endemic species and residents and migrants and threatened birds. Um, there's actually 171 species of birds that are endemic to the Caribbean. Um, they can be found here and nowhere else in the world. So species like the um, toady, the little bird that you see on the upper left with the pink sides, trogons, hummingbirds, amazing birds. And if you haven't yet traveled to the Caribbean for, to see birds, I encourage you to try to do so. Uh, so we welcome you to follow us on um, social media. Just look for Birds Caribbean. And I'll also put in the chat box where you can sign up to get our newsletter if you're interested in following all kinds of news and information about Caribbean birds, both our endemics and our migrants. Great. Yes, I loved the Caribbean. I've been to a lot of the islands and this is you down there with the annual yep. uh, conference for Birds Caribbean. So it's a yep. great organization. Yep. Thanks for all of your hard work. Okay. And then just one last piece of information for our Caribbean celebration of World Migratory Bird Day, we have been doing a migratory bird of the day. So that is posted on our website and there's, um, and also on our social media. So um, nearly every day you can download a new coloring page, you can get natural history information, um, see beautiful photos of these birds. Um, videos, hear their calls, and so forth. So I encourage you to follow us at um, our website. Just look at that bit.ly link, Birds Connect Our World, and I'll also put the link in the chat window. So um, if you have kids, the coloring book is great, and then we also have fun activities like crossword puzzles and word searches and things like that, all related to migratory birds. So Wonderful. thanks a lot. And Christine, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Okay, Lisa. Are there three books now that you've produced? For kids? Uh, yeah, we've got a few different books. The, we have two coloring books right now. We have the Endemic Birds of the West Indies, which Christine is our illustrator on. It's a fabulous book. Uh, I've got one handy right here to show you. And this is available for free download also on our website. And there's also coloring pages that you can download. So just look for that on our website as well. We've got the Migratory Bird Coloring Book. And then we've got some other Fun resources for kids, lots of activity pages. We've got curriculum for teachers. So just take a look at our resources page and you'll find lots of cool stuff. About Fabulous. Okay, great. Well, Lisa, I'll take over now and you can stay in the chat box if people have sure. questions for Lisa or anything about Birds of the Caribbean or her organization, Birds Caribbean. Uh, you can ask in the chat box and Lisa will answer you. And, uh, Lisa, if you could just um, turn off your sound, which I think you have, that would be great. Okay, so let's really get started. Uh, uh, Mary Ellen says it is streaming on Facebook, so it looks like we're good here. So we're both on Facebook and Crowdcast, and you can put some uh, of your um, comments on Facebook as well. And then after we're done with this, it will be up on the Birds Caribbean uh, YouTube channel eventually as well. 
So anyway, how do we roll today? Basically, um, we have the resources button down below where it says download your barn owl image. And uh, hopefully you've heard about that. Uh, and I did send you a link to that. So if you had a chance to download your high resolution image, that's great. If you didn't, no worries. Just have a pencil and paper and you can follow along with us. But if you're really afraid of drawing, don't worry, don't leave us. Stick around uh, because we're going to start off with the biology and anatomy of owls and barn owls in particular. And then we'll lead you through a sketching demo. And if you're afraid to sketch, you can just watch and uh, kind of warm up, maybe watch the replay. You're free to um, sign up, um, come to the same link later on here on Crowdcast or replay it on Facebook, of course. And you can always watch the replay again, especially if you want to go through the sketching demo. So uh, then at the end, we're going to have sharing, which is one of my favorite parts. And that's where you can get up and ask questions uh, for either me or Lisa Sorensen, the executive director of Birds Caribbean. And then, um, yeah, so you can also share your sketches because lots of times people are able to share. We're gonna go really slowly, step by step. So I promise you can share. Um, um, I mean, that you can follow along and I'd love to see your beautiful faces up here sharing with us. Because like a lot of people, uh, me and Lisa probably too are sheltering in place, working from home and we don't get as much um, outside, um, uh, uh, you know, talking with ch people as we'd probably like to. <laughs> okay, so anyway, let's keep going here. <laughs> so anyway, again, today the topic is sketching barn owls. And first we're going to introduce owls in general, the two families, some of their general characteristics, and then we're going to do, I think, about a 20-minute demo of how to draw them. So thank you everybody who's joined so far. Uh, I just wanted to say hi to people like uh, Carol and um, who else do we have? Patricia, Pat, Dennis, Mary Ellen, Iris, Elaine, uh, Anya, um, Joji, Jacqueline, Bridget. Thank you so much for joining us today. And of course, all of you folks who are watching us and uh, participating on Facebook. So you know it's only a couple days until Halloween and there's uh, lots of myths and legends about owls. And so that's why we left um, this third uh, workshop in the series um, on owls to be just before Halloween. I did want to remind you, like I think Lisa said, that we had two other workshops in this series that I've taught. One other one was on the American Kestrel and also one on the Northern Pintail. So, but the barn owl and owls in general have been in myth and legends uh, for, you know, for time immemorial, right? And um, so depending on where you're from in the world, owls either represented good or bad omens, right? And, uh, and I encourage you later on to go to the Birds Caribbean uh, YouTube channel and watch their presentation on the legend of Chick Charney. And that was presented by Scott Johnson of the um, Bahamas National Trust. And he tells you all about this legend, which is about um, a bird that may or may not have actually been a real barn owl uh, ancestor that lived in the Bahamas. Okay, so owls, you know, we have this common name owl, and we generally think they'd be all related, and they are to some extent, but they are in two different families. So we've got our um, barn owls, which are um, over here, right? And so these guys are in the family Titanidae, uh, and this barn owl is actually um, named for that. Its genus is Tito. And so there's just about 18 species in two genera. And the barn owl that we have here in North America is our um, basically our only representative here in North America. And then the other family are what we call our um, regular or typical owls. They're in a different family from barn owls in the um, Strigidae, a lot more diverse. There's over 200 species of those. Uh, in 26 genera, and they're all over the world. So we're not going to talk too much more about them. We're going to focus on the barn owl family. Um, so, you know, we will uh, chat a little bit, though, about general characteristics um, and things that they share. 
Now, the, the barn owl family uh, is a little bit different than your typical owls in that generally they have a lighter build, they have longer legs, they have that heart-shaped face. Um, they have asymmetrical ear holes, which some of the other uh, genera in the true owls do as well, but not all of them to help them hear. Also the barn owl family, they don't do the characteristic hooting as much as a normal owl. They're gonna be more of a uh, sort of a screamer or a hisser. And that might be another reason that barn owls in particular are uh, known a lot from legend, not only because they're white and fly around at night and are um, great predators and kind of spooky looking, looking white like a ghost, but also because they have this voice. Barn owl family has more like hisses instead of hoots, which again is probably another reason that uh, they're uh, well represented in uh, legends and folk tales, um, spooky things of this, of this time of year, okay? So let's see, where were we going? Yeah, so anyway, we were talking about how there's the two families, the barn owls and the typical owls and how the barn owl family um, has the lighter build and longer legs. And um, here we go here. So the, the barn owl is right here. And um, there are actually 15, uh, about 15 species uh, in that group. And then there are three species in this other group, this kind of funny looking guy um, called, they, these guys are called bay owls. And um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, in general, this family also, um, besides being lighter build and longer legs with this heart faced shape instead of just the uh, oval shape, um, they do have the asymmetrical ears, like I mentioned, uh, the ear holes in their skull, which are just to the um, outside of where their eyes are. And that helps them to hear better and to really pinpoint where their prey are at night. Uh, and their legs are completely feathered. You can see these feathering. So a lot more feathering on the legs than the other owls. Um, and it's thought that they're kind of more, this, this family of barn owls is more in warmer and tropical regions, uh, except our barn owl, which does get a lot farther north than a lot of other members of this family up into um, Canada and Alaska. So, um, and there are also another group of, um, of barn owls that are called masked owls. Uh, or sooty or red owls. And also there's an ashy faced owl. <laughs> so anyway, there's, uh, like I said, about 18 species all together in this family. Oh, I see uh, Lisa. Yeah, put a link here um, for the call of the barn owl. You can hear that on eBird. Thanks. So we'll get, maybe we'll get back to that later if we have a chance. Okay, so anyway, in general, characteristics of all owls, regardless of which uh, family they're in. So you see they have the super characteristic face. They um, have a lot of uh, adaptations for being nocturnal and for being birds of prey. They're basically the, um, the nocturnal version of our hawks and our eagles, the, the beautios and all those guys. So they're even better um, at hunting at night. So they've got these really large eyes. Uh, sometimes they're colored, sometimes they're dark, like in our barn owl. So they can be gold or orange or yellow, but giant eyes. And the eyes are very much pointed forward on a big flat face. So that's more forward than in, you know, other basic songbirds or even in most birds of prey. So they've got a flatter face eyes painting, pointing forward, very large eyes so that they can see their prey at night. And they have got great binocular vision. So they're gonna see, um, you know, have a lot better depth of vision. Although they can't see very well close up. And so they've got lots of hairs on their facial uh, disc here that help them to feel their prey once they have it in their mouth, especially um, also kind of these, uh, 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 thread-like feathers that uh, are on the legs as well to help them feel their prey. So anyway, they've got this big flat facial disc of all of these hairs that radiate, um, well, feather, hair-like 
feathers that radiate from the center here, and they can move those to some extent to help them again to pinpoint the sound of their prey. And their uh, bill is very hooked and strong and often serrated. So uh, again, a lot like uh, diurnal birds of prey like hawks, uh, but it's kind of lower on the face and kind of flatter and pointed down more, which helps their eyes to be able to see their binocular vision better to see the prey and as also to hear them with that facial uh, disc. So yeah, that's a lot about the face. <laughs> so some owls have these big tufts on their head. Um, they're called ear tufts. And, you know, there's lots of um, members of the um, regular typical owl family that have that, like the long-eared owl, short-eared, flammulated, screech owl, and of course this um, great horned owl. Uh, and those have nothing to do with ears. Uh, they have to do with their mood and they can um, move them around a bit and flatten them on their body if they want to. And uh, what else was I going to say about that? Uh, yeah. So now uh, another reason that owls are uh, kind of connected with Halloween and connected with uh, spooky things and the macabre is because they can turn their head so far. So in this uh, image, you can see the barn owl turning all the way around and they can turn up to 270 degrees. And that relates to the fact that since their eyes are very um, much facing forward, it's not like a, uh, you know, a deer that has eyes on the side of their head and they can easily see to the left and the right. They have very much forward facing um, eyes that can't move in their sockets. Uh, so they have to have a, a head that's much more um, flexible. And so they've actually got a longer neck and more vertebrae than say like humans do. They've got 14 vertebrae in that neck, which allows them to turn all the way around both left and right. And they can also tip their head um, almost upside down as well. So that's another reason that they're uh, associated with Halloween and scary things because they're almost like demonic in the way that they can uh, turn their head. It almost seems otherworldly. Okay. And um, let's see, owls, uh, these are a few more owls from actually Central America, photos from my friend James Adams there, just showing that uh, owls are basically kind of stocky, uh, round with short tails uh, and um, really kind of short, uh, their head sort of is just an extension of their body. It's very large for their size relatively. And they're going to have a lot of this very uh, cryptic coloration. Uh, now, they these guys are pretty obvious against the green of the leaves, but you know, depending on where an owl is at any moment, it may might blend in better or not. So they often have these very interesting camouflaged uh, colorations um, and lots of intricate markings on them that make them fun actually to draw and paint. Uh, let's see, they live in lots of different habitats, depending on the species all over the world. Uh, so really varied depending on, like I said, the species and the latitude, you know, owls in general range from up in the boreal forests of Europe and America down into Argentina and South Africa. So uh, really varied have taken over a lot of um uh, ecosystems and their important predators and help with rodent control, right? Uh, a few more examples. Of course, lots of owls are nocturnal. Some of them are more crepuscular, meaning you can see them better during the morning and night. And some are more diurnally active. So you'll see barn owls outdoors outside too during the day. And uh, here's another kind of owl that screeches instead of as much as hooting. <laughs> and uh, another uh, example of different color patterns. There aren't very many owls that are very lightly colored. Like the barn owl is the beautiful cream color and the snowy owl is very white. Um, this picture is also to remind me that uh, lots of owls, um, you know, are usually in the trees and flying around and perching in trees, but some owls are more 
on the ground, like snowy owls, you know, owls that are going to live up in the tundra and boreal forests where there's not as many trees. Uh, and then, of course, burrowing owls, those guys are in North America, like the snowy. And those guys are going to be found mostly on the ground. And you can see those in the daytime as well. Uh, and then owls really range in size. Uh, the great gray owl is our largest, up to 27 inches long. Uh, another owl, the spotted owl you've probably heard about, which was uh, made the Pacific Northwest uh, uh, virgin old growth forests famous in the 80s and 90s with the spotted owl wars. <laughs> Now, this picture is to remind me about their feathers, of course. They're very silent flyers. So all the owls, both families, have these adaptations of their feathers to have very soft edges and kind of uh, velvety on the top and bottom, and that makes them able to fly very silently. Again, this is a great adaptation for being uh, the fierce predators that, that they are and to sneak up on their prey. Uh, but the problem with that, though, is that owls in general aren't as uh, waterproof, especially not like ducks. So they can get cold easy and you're not going to see them out hunting in the rain and the snow. OK, so moving on a little bit closer to what we're really talking about today specifically is our barn owl. And again, this is the third workshop in a series where we're talking about migratory birds of the world. And um, so this is what we're talking about, Taito Alba. Alba, the word means white, and Taito uh, refers to the um, family name, Titanidae. And so, you know, they've, they um, historically have been one of the world's most uh, abundant and widespread species. And some folks have talked about that there might be some subspecies, but I'm not really up on the taxonomy and that's always changing. But in general, they're all over the place. And of course, they're all over here in North America. And... Um, yeah, oh, Joji in the chat box, Joji asked, the subjects of the first two workshops in the series were the uh, northern pintail duck and the American kestrel. And you can still see those if you go to my uh, main Crowdcast page or if you go onto the Birds Caribbean YouTube channel. Okay, and so uh, let's see, let's see, where was I? So there are lots of different habitats since they are so widespread. Barn owls can be, you know, down into the tropical rainforests uh, and in uh, deciduous forests, in evergreen forests. Uh, they can be kind of uh, here uh, in cottonwood forests. Uh, so they are very, a um, lot of different habitats. Uh, but generally within the home range of any one individual, they're going to have some um, some forested area, as well as some open land to be able to, to hunt. And here's one uh, in a, uh, I think a palm tree. And this one's a juvenile. You can see it's still got some of its baby feathers there. Great. Here's an image of them flying. You see, uh, this is just a good uh, image here to see how long their legs are. So again, this family of owls, remember there's two families, uh, the barn owl family uh, are um, longer legged with a lot more feathers down on the legs than regular owls. And the males and females differ to some extent, like most uh, owls, the females are larger uh, to some extent. Now, barn owls are about 16 inches high and about a pound, that they weigh about a pound. Isn't that amazing? Um, so they're kind of a mid-size between our smallest elfs and our largest great grays. And here's that heart-shaped face, that characteristic heart-shaped face. So all owls have that facial disc, but they don't have, um, you know, only the barn owl uh, family has sort of a more heart um, at the bottom instead of sort of two half circle commas that the other owls have. So uh, females are generally a bit larger than the one pound, and they have a darker uh, uh, coloration in general. And you can see, though, uh, how camouflaged they are, this cryptic coloration, just beautiful. 
And here they are flying. You can see those big feathers. Again, they fly silently like other members um, of the owl family, owl families with the um, special uh, feather structure to let them fly silently. And so they are fierce hunters, you know, uh, in the whole two families of owls, uh, the diets really vary throughout the year and for each species. Uh, the smaller owls might focus more on uh, insects and uh, other invertebrates, whereas the larger owls might go for uh, rodents like this one here, um, or even, you know, larger mammals. And then some owls like uh, great horned owls will even go after other owls and other smaller birds of um, prey. So variety of uh, food is very wide. And you see down here these big, strong talons, just like other birds of prey that can grasp um, that prey item and uh, crush it easily, break its back for um, making it edible. Okay, and then here's a cute picture of just one feeding the baby. Um, and so they're gonna be nesting uh, uh, with their partner, uh, usually in trees, uh, old cavities like those left by um, maybe larger uh, woodpeckers or other um, cavity dwellers. Sometimes they'll use an old nest of a hawk or other bird of prey. Uh, sometimes they'll nest even in the witch's brooms of trees. And uh, of course, sometimes in barns. <laughs> Now, uh, barn owls, not all owls eat their food whole, but barn owls do. And it's uh, really interesting to be able to look at the recurgitated remains, which are called owl pellets. Some of you may have done that in school, uh, dissected an owl pellet, because each pellet is an exact whole skeleton. So you can very easily uh, study the um, diversity of prey because uh, you can identify them to species by looking at the bones. Okay, and so there's some examples of some of the uh, roosting and nesting habitats. Okay, and you can learn a lot more about birds and general bird anatomy and owls as well. Uh, in this great book, The Manual of Ornithology, it has this really cute uh, cover of the Eastern Screech Owl. And there's a uh, picture of the skeleton, you know, similar to other uh, birds in general. Uh, but you see, yeah, you see the, uh, the large head and that long neck that allows them to turn 270 degrees. And in a sec, we'll learn, look more at these wings because we're going to be drawing those. Okay, and so here's that outstretched wing. We are going to be having a pretty challenging bird today, but many of you watching have drawn a lot of birds with me, and some of you have already drawn the very challenging American kestrel with me uh, and the pintail duck. <laughs> and so here's some of those feathers. These are the feathers of the primary flight feathers um, on the wing, and you can see how they are sort of barred there. So lots of different colors on each wing that contributes to the overall uh, barring and spotting pattern of the whole bird. Okay, let's keep going. We got to start sketching. There's a lots of advantages to sketching, and I encourage all of you guys, no matter if you think that you can't draw a straight line or a stick figure, I really encourage you to take a sketchbook out in the field or even a, a clipboard and some paper and draw what you see. For me, it doesn't matter um, if your drawing looks like uh, just a little kid's cartoon. The fact that you looked at something long enough to draw it will give you a greater appreciation and understanding of its anatomy and behavior. And especially if you're a bird watcher or a beginning bird watcher, sketching them is a great way to uh, learn those field marks and to, and to learn to identify the birds much more quickly. Okay, so uh, I love to travel. I've traveled all over the world uh, sketching birds, uh, both teaching uh, sketching workshops and leading tours and leading bird birding, bird watching tours uh, all over, mostly the Western Hemisphere. So it really helps me, like this picture in uh, Costa Rica where I was sketching the um, Quetzal. 
Okay, so just a, a few quick tips before we start, because I think um, I recognize a lot of your names in the chat box, and I know a lot of you people have sketched with me already, but I want you to try to um, pretend that we're sketching in the field. We're not going to do, uh, you know, an ornithological illustration like a John James Audubon. So we want to try to pretend we're sketching live moving birds. So we want to really hold our pencil uh, lightly and loosely. Let me just uh, make my face a little bit bigger here right now. I want you to um, uh, make a, uh, your pencil light and loose. I often use a mechanical pencil and you just keep that pencil moving. It just keep looking and observing and keep drawing. Avoid erasing, continuing to glance back and forth at your subject and your paper, looking at your subject even more than you look at your paper to make sure that you're drawing from um, observation and not from memory or imagination. And like I said before, focusing on the process rather than the final product and appreciating how much you've learned about that organism after you finish, no matter how awful your drawing is. I don't even care if you crumple up your drawing and throw it away afterwards. What I care is that you've learned something about the, you know, the eyes and the beak and the wing structure and the tail and the talons uh, much more than you ever would if you were just looking at it from binoculars or even reading about it or watching a video. Okay. And let's see, we have in the chat box, uh, Lisa is mentioning the birds of the world is a fantastic resource. That's right. Okay, great. So let's keep going. Yeah. So like I said, we're not trying to be John James Audubon here. Here's a couple of beautiful uh, paintings that he did from life or death, as it were, <laughs> uh, including a barn owl and a great horned owl. And you can see all that beautiful detail. Okay, so we're going to sketch. This is the bird we're sketching in this pose. It's a very interesting, uh, complicated pose, but I promise uh, that you're going to be able to do it. It's going to be about 20 or 30 minutes, I think. And um, we've already spoken a bit about the anatomy of owls, so that should help you to draw more accurately. Uh, but there's a few other things you can think about while you're drawing. Be looking, make sure to be looking at proportions. So, you know, when we start our drawing, we're going to start with a circle, and then we're going to start thinking about uh, the relative proportion of the parts that we add to that circle. So how big the circle of the facial disc is compared to the body, and how long the tail is in proportion to the length of the body, okay? Then we're going to want to look at angles, okay? So that means like... Um, these angles between the wings. This is like a 90 degree angle. And then um, alignments. You want to look at what structures are aligned with other ones. Like you see in these secondary feathers, they're all parallel to each other and lined up. And so is uh, all this barring on the tail. And the two legs are lined up parallel. And then next is negative shapes. So noticing the shapes that aren't the bird. And that will help you to draw the bird just as much as if you're looking at the actual shape of the bird, maybe even more. So things like this nice little triangle here that's between the back of the body and the wing. So that's what I mean by negative shapes, okay? And um, since we're drawing this, uh, bird, this whole bird here, uh, I'll be showing you a close-up of the face so that you can draw that a little bit more accurately. And here again, you can see that big flat facial disc will draw. Those big eyes that are dark in the barn owl, they're not yellow or gold like some of those other uh, species. And they've got this uh, very strong bill that's very strongly hooked and it's kind of hidden between these uh, these tactile feathers that help it to manipulate the prey. And it's well below the eye, you notice, way down there and, and really pointing down instead of out, like you might see how like a bald eagle has the, um, the, the hooked beak very much uh, in the same uh, plane and height as the eye. Okay, so then we're gonna be drawing the, the wings 
and uh, we're going to be noticing the different parts there. And if you know um, much about birds, the wing is sort of uh, homologous to our arms. So it's they've got the um, shoulder that's kind of hidden within the uh, body. And then they've got the forearm. And at the end of the forearm is the wrist. And this big set of feathers here, this is actually three feathers called the alula. And those are attached to the actual thumb of the hand of the bird. And those really help them in maneuvering, especially when they're uh, slowing down like this bird is just about to capture its prey. So they can lift those just like you can um, when you're flying in a plane and you see them lifting the, the parts of the those little levers on the wing to help them to, uh, to uh, land, right? And then there's two parts to the wing we're gonna draw. The primary flight feathers, which are right here, um, every group of birds has a different number of feathers in general, and owls have 10 of these primaries. And if you notice, they're all radiating pretty much from this wrist area. So they're going to kind of be going out in uh, directions like this. And then there's a big set of feathers back here. Uh, usually uh, owls, they're kind of like ducks and having a whole bunch of feathers. Um, and there's, I think, about 15. Usually in owls, I think the secondaries are like between 12 and 18 or something. And I think there's 15 here. But we can't see all of those, but we do see that they're parallel here. And there's a, a, a set of them that are kind of lifted up. But um, partly that's just because of the way uh, this owl is going in for the, the kill and starting to break. Okay, let's see. Now, then when we draw the other wing, we'll notice, again, the, um, the forearm and the alula. You can actually kind of see the three alula feathers here. And then there's all of these feathers on top that we can see on the bird's uh, left wing. And those are, um, those are what we call coverts that are kind of covering and making that wing more aerodynamic and protecting the flight feathers. And then you see all these flight feathers. And what I really want you to notice when we're drawing this in just a second is how they overlap. So if you were um, if you were a tiny little ant and you were on the bird's back, you would be going out, out this way towards the edge of the wing, and you would be stair stepping down. Each each um, of these parallel feathers would be each one would be under the one after it. So when we draw it, this one will be on top and then under, 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 under. Whereas this one, when we're looking at them from the bottom, it's just the opposite. And this outermost feather will look like it's on top and we'll be drawing this um, under, 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 under. Okay. Anyway, it seems like we're spending a lot of time talking about anatomy, but it's going to really help you to draw more quickly and more accurately. And we're going to start in just a second because I know we're a little bit behind time. So then we're going to draw the feet and uh, I will have sort of a close up for you to see them a little bit better. Not going to spend much time on those because it does take a while to really learn foot anatomy. But what I do want to make sure that you notice is that the legs are quite long for an owl and they've got all of these feathers and then they have the um, the ankle. Well, no, wait, the ankle's back here. And then they um, have the three toes pointing forward and one back. So on the bird's right foot, we can see all three of those one, two, three. And then this is the, the back, um, the back toe. But anyway, those will be pretty small, so we're not going to spend much time on those today. And again, today's not a biological illustration, and we're not ornithologists. Uh, we're just trying to draw to uh, learn and appreciate more about birds. Okay, so who's ready to get started? Tell me in the chat box. Okay, so we're going to get started. And um, so we're going to start with the overall shape. And then we're going to get each of the parts and we'll I'll be showing you a close up photo of each of those parts to make it easier. And your homework is to draw the other bird on the right. But we are only drawing this larger bird on the left for now. The one on the right is just for fun to show you a bird facing you in a little bit different direction. 
and a different lighting. You can see much richer coloration in that one. Okay, so ready? Now, if you only have a regular piece of paper, um, like this one is, you should just draw it about half the size of a regular piece of paper. Um, either if it's too much bigger or smaller than that, then it's going to um, take you a lot longer to draw or you won't be able to get the level of detail we want to get. Okay, let's get going. So I first just air draw by looking at all these parts that we already talked about. So just naming those to yourself in your mind, noticing those angles, alignments, and negative shapes and relative proportions. And um, so we're going to start by placing our uh, main body uh, on the piece of paper. We're going to be drawing sort of an oval to just get the main body mass before we start adding the extremities. So I want you to draw as lightly and loosely as you possibly can, um, even lighter than this. I draw, I draw this dark so that you can see it, but I hope that you will be drawing it uh, lighter. So you don't feel the need to do too much erasing, okay? So we're just drawing a circle for the whole body first, just getting the sort of length and width. And I do a lot of measuring like I am here to double check because we want to really get our proportions correct before we start adding all of the individual feathers and, and legs and tails and all that. So I've got my outline of my body. So I'm just kind of lightening it up now so it's not too distracting. And then I'm going to firm it up. And again, remember, you can always watch the replay if we're going too fast and you can watch it, I think, at slower speed even or pause it anytime you want. Just looking at those relative proportions, going to get that little oval of the face and get a lot more detail on that later. So right now we're just placing the width and the height of the face, that big flat facial disc. And placing the, yeah, there we go, and the neck and the legs, just a little box to show where the legs are, just kind of the length and width and noticing sort of where it is. Then moving on to the tail and looking at that angle, that's kind of a 45 degree angle that the tail is at because this bird is coming in for the, for the pounce, for the kill and he's sort of breaking. I think this is a he because he's pretty light on the belly. Again, the males are gonna be a little darker, I mean, a little lighter and smaller. So just getting this tail, we see um, the whole left side of, well, the whole, the, the bird's right side of this tail and a little bit of the fuzz underneath and of the bird's other side of his tail. <clears throat> and the upper tail coverts and those fluffy belly feathers that we're going to keep very light. They've got 12 uh, feathers in their tail, and we can kind of see these six parallel feathers on the bird's right group, but we'll add those uh, a little bit later. Very lightly uh, penciling in the uh, upper tail coverts and the undertail coverts and that those belly and bent feathers that are very downy and light. Now putting some more energy into the uh, legs here. Noticing the length and the height of that mass. So you see, I always start from the most general shapes and then get more specific. I know it looks pretty funny right now, but we're going to get there. I was just placing the eye there for fun. Okay, now we're going to get closer to this right wing, noticing where it sort of aligns there with the head and then goes up at a very gentle angle. And we're just going to draw a big, big oval for where it is. 
placing where the shoulder is there and the, the joint of the shoulder and forearm and then all the way out to the primary flight feathers. The little alula feathers group and then the big oval for the primaries and secondaries. Double checking the length and width. Always doing a lot of that early on so we don't get too off base. So we can keep seeing the forest for the trees as they say and looking at the big picture before we start adding any details. Noticing that nice negative triangular shape between the secondaries and the bird's back. So it just kind of looks like a big old paddle for now, but again, we're just getting the representing kind of the left brained symbolic shapes of the bird before we get more into the right brained uh, exact shapes. Now we're gonna place his, his left wing. We're gonna notice how far back it starts from the head disc. Double checking my proportions first. So I'm always doing that um, many times. Firming up the back. So now we're gonna place the wing. How far is it back from the face, the heart-shaped face shield? And how wide is the wing? It's right there. The back of it comes pretty close to the alula of the right wing. And now that we have the front and the back leading edge, we're gonna make a big oval for the whole wing. So we've got the forearm there. We've got the little oval of the alula, those three feathers that can be used to break. Then we have the primary flight feathers. We only see those on the bird's left wing. The secondaries are hidden behind the other wing. Double checking our widths, firming things up. Okay, just keep going here. I got a little bit squished on the side of my paper, but that's okay. Getting the coverts area there, those upper wing coverts, and then the primary flight feathers, and they're very arched. And that leading primary feather almost comes in front of the alula. See how it angles, how it aligns? So we're always looking at relative proportions, angles, alignments, negative shapes, over and over again as we draw. Okay, we're getting all that penciled in. Hopefully you're keeping up. And if you're not, you can always watch the replay. So noticing what, where we are in the, in the, uh, in the video. Okay, now I'm gonna give you a close up of this face. We're obviously not gonna get all this detail, but I just wanted you to be able to see it better uh, from pretty much the same angle. Uh, this bird is, um, this big image, it's looking at us just slightly more than the other bird in the paper, but that's okay. Uh, I just wanted to show you this image and have you use it to refer to so that you could see the bill because the bill is pretty much completely hidden in this bird that's flying. So we're just getting this heart-shaped face. So I'm getting that um, upper edge there of the heart. So we see where the top of the heart dips into the face and keeping that super soft because those are all very super soft, light feathers of that facial disc. So you should probably be uh, even lighter than I'm drawing right now just because I'm making it so you can see it. So remember it's heart shaped. So it's gonna be kind of a little bit pointed down towards the bottom compared to the other family of birds. Remember there's two families of owls and these barn owls all have more of the heart-shaped face with the pointed sort of chin part of the facial disc. 
then placing the eye, seeing where it is kind of in line with the wing. So I'm always comparing structures to one another where they are at. And just being a little bit more careful, noticing this eye isn't a big old circle. It's a teardrop sort of shape. And we're going to want to leave a highlight in there. Later on, you might even want to draw a close up of this face um, on the left, on the right side of your paper, um, if you, in case you don't want to draw that other bird that's in the photo. Because this very beautiful face here, all this interesting, beautiful burnt sienna feathers that come off um, of the eye and come down and overlap the bill. So just drawing the little kind of hooked bill there. We don't see much of it. It's mainly covered by those kind of tactile feathers that help it to um, feel uh, the prey items. And I guess it's mate or anything else it might want to uh, come in contact with. Now softening up the edge of that heart-shaped disc. And, you know, we can't get a whole lot of detail here because of the size, but we can just try. Okay, hopefully you're keeping up. Everybody's quiet in the chat box, so I assume you're keeping up. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna go and we're gonna get some detail now on those legs. I know they're kind of challenging, uh, so don't, try not to be intimidated. We're gonna get the uh, kind of the four legs there that are heavily feathered. So the outline of those is going to be pretty soft and feathery. And it's just the very end of the legs that don't have feathers on them. Very strong. So just really emphasize how strong those, those uh, individual toes and talons are to be able to grasp their prey. Whether it's a vole or a alligator lizard or a frog or even a grasshopper. So just kind of slowly looking at that right foot. We're going to draw the right foot first because it's in front and we'll put the left foot behind it. And um, I'm not drawing the, the ring around it. I'm not drawing his, bra his silver bracelet. So um, and just getting some loose feathery areas on his vent area. See, I'm avoiding the legs. Those are always intimidating. Okay, so now we're gonna get to those legs and those individual toes. And again, you can't get a lot of detail, so it won't matter if you um, are very good at this or not, because it's pretty small, but we're just gonna notice that the right foot, we can see three toes, well, basically two toes that are parallel to each other facing forward. So get, get the claw there of toe number one, claw of toe number two. And the toe and claw of number three, which is kind of angled, pointing down at like five o'clock. And then there's the rear toe that would normally grasp the back of a branch. Just make sure you get that right leg stronger. Those lines will be stronger than the leg that um, is hidden on the left. And that leg, we primarily just see the front two toes that are parallel, but they kind of overlap, so you don't see much there. And I'm just trying to go more slowly and carefully. And getting that left leg. This does take some time. And just looking at your reference photo here on the left, if you can. Just 
So they have those strong pads on the undersides of the toes to help them grasp their prey as well as grasp the branches. Owls will often roost um, on a horizontal branch very close to the trunk. <laughs> okay, so that's the general outline. Uh, we're gonna continue now getting some more details. I know we've already gone an hour, but it did take us a bit to get started. So hopefully you can hang around or you can watch the replay. So we're getting some details on the tail. We can see um, we're drawing some parallel lines to see those six feathers of the right side of the tail. And then very light feathers that are under the tail and in the vent. A little bit more detail there to finish out before we move on to the right wing. Now the details of the right wing. And it's shadowed underneath there. Okay, the right wing. So we're going to get the forearm there. So strengthening up that forearm and you see it's very strong line and it's very much in the sun. So there's kind of like two parallel lines that I'm drawing that are where the sun is really capturing that leading edge of the forearm. And then we've got the alula, the three feathers of the thumb basically, and then the primaries and, and that's that, that Feather really arches. And like I said before, those 10 primaries are all radiating out from that wrist joint next to and below the alula. So kind of an arched line. And, um, you know, we don't have to get particular here, but I am going to sort of count these. There is a big triangle here of these 10 primary flight feathers. And since this is the part of the bird that is closest to us in the photo, um, maybe even as much as a foot closer to us in real life, I'd like to emphasize those even maybe more than they would be. So we see this big triangle of feathers, okay? And those are 10 feathers. But don't worry if you don't get them exact, but we're just going to draw them. And the very outermost one that I'm pointing at with the orange pencil is on top because we're looking at the underside of the feather. So now we're doing just these kind of half circles and noticing too that the each feather is kind of um, flattened at the end. So they, they kind of the shape varies depending on which feather it is on the bird. The farther back they go, back towards the secondaries, the more blunt they are at the end. So I'm just pointing with the orange just to keep track so that we can kind of count, but don't worry if you don't get it exact. But uh, since I am a trained biological illustrator, I can't help but try to be a little bit accurate, especially if I do have a photograph to draw from. So again, that joint right there is where all of these lines are going to radiate from. And I'm just sort of doing them symbolically at this point, not totally accurately. I'm getting a little bit off, you see, but just wanting you to keep in your mind that these are each overlapping as we go farther towards the, um, the base of the bird. Now we've got a big set of these 15 or so uh, yeah, let's see, I wrote down 15 or so of the secondaries and tertials, which are the smallest feathers at the very end. And I'm not being exact as those, but those are all attached in the parallel along the forearm. And if you want to be able to be more confident drawing birds and their feathers, I would suggest you study bird skeletons, mounted skeletons, or photographs of them. Okay, so now we're going to do the other wing. This should be a little bit easier. So notice we're drawing the top of the wing. We got the alula again. 
we're going to firm up. There's actually three feathers. You can't see them very well, but if you study, you know, bird anatomy, that really helps you before you go out in the field to sketch. So you kind of know what to look for. So even if you don't see it totally accurately, it'll help you a lot. Now we're going to draw those primaries that that same group that we drew before um, of about 10 of them, but they're farther away from us and we can kind of blur those out. So you don't have to be as exact, but I will be pointing to each one so you can keep track. And again, noticing where they're radiating from, from the uh, Alula area. That's the wrist where all those primaries are going to be attached to those finger bones that we can't really see that are um, shortened, a lot shorter than say in a, in a bat, which has the same bones, but shaped a bit differently and their fingers are longer to have the outstretched flight membrane attached. Okay, so anyway, we saw those feathers. Now I'm just gonna strengthen those up and noticing how those overlap. Each of those lines represents a feather that's on top of the feather going out. So again, pretending you were an ant, if you were walking from the base, um, the bird's back out onto the outer wing, just like an airplane wing, each of those feathers would go under, 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 under until you got to this very last feather which is going to be the very most underneath. So that's just the most aerodynamic uh, shape for being able to fly. And just double checking, just kind of counting. I think you can see about 10 of them, but they are a little blurred. And again, if you're, if you're intimidated about this or for going too fast, you can just kind of loosen this up lighten the lines or even smear them with your finger. And that's fine because that's the wing that's farther away. And so it would be more, um, you know, it would be more blurry in real life if we didn't have this high resolution photography that shows just about every single micro feather, right? But I'm just strengthening these lines just so you can see them. Okay, so now we got that whole outline. We're finishing up by just adding a little bit of shading. Now, shading takes a long time to add three-dimensional form and all these colors and patterns. We don't have time for that today, um, but we're just adding a little bit of an emphasis because we do see some shadows here on the neck. And so whatever kind of pencil, if you have a different shading pencil, this is what I'm using now. I'm using a, a richer, darker shading pencil. And um, sometimes I use it on its side to get more graphite on. So I'm just going around like here, I'm using it on its side, going around, looking back and forth at the areas that are darker. So don't see this bird as a white bird or a cream colored bird. Now we're trying to look at the shadows and the markings, like this barring on the tail and the cast shadows on the body from the wings. And then we're almost done with at least what we're doing today, because we could go forever, of course. These owls, you know, owls in general have very beautiful, cryptic, camouflaged coloration. So you could take a long time to do a drawing of one of these for sure. So I am just starting. Generally, you do just want to start with getting the three-dimensional form before you add any of the colors or textures. That's your basis. So you see I'm really noticing these cast shadows under the wing. There, okay, and then there's there's shadows where the under uh, underwing covert verts are located. <laughs> and I blurred them a little bit with my finger. And you can also blur if you have one of these smudging stomps. Or you can use uh, even a Q-tip to blur if you don't want to use your finger. Something that's more pointy and can get you some more uh, exact details. 
so I'm just kind of checking back and forth, looking at this bird, not so much as a bird, but a collection of light and dark values. I'm just giving a little bit of details to separate out these wing feathers. And these, all these beautiful kind of spots and streaks and, and stripes uh, we don't have time for, but you can just notice that there's uh, each, each feather has uh, a bunch of lines on them. So I'm just doing that really light and loose. You could always refer back to the uh, slide that showed the, the feathers if you want to get those in more detail. Or you can look online. There's some very good websites that show all of the feathers of a bird, like uh, Feather Base. So just getting a little bit of that dotted spotty pattern of that gray and black on the head and the back and the sides. Again, we're kind of pretending this is more of a field sketch than a finished, you know, this is definitely not an Audubon Society painting. This is a quick field sketch, just trying to get a little bit of a suggestion of three-dimensional form and colors and patterns. And it's your homework to uh, put some added three-dimensional form and colors and patterns on this later on. Okay, so we're almost done. I'm just gonna, I'm just going back with my uh, sharper, harder mechanical pencil, just adding a little bit more detail. Working on that line, like um, Elaine said, you know, that's a, a line of dark feathers. And, uh, you know, that's going to move a bit depending on how the uh, bird is moving those facial feathers to capture the prey and whether it's warm or cold. But generally, yeah, they come like a, they look like a tear all, almost that's coming out of the bird's eye down. Now just doing a little light dotting pattern of those black and gray streaks and spots on the body. And you can always go back to the slideshow and look at any of the earlier photographs to see um, that this pattern better in better light when they're not flying. Now, since this is such a widely ranging bird, there's going to be a lot of different subtle color morphs between uh, the, the individuals, depending on uh, where they're living, their habitat, their um, whether they're male or female or adult or juvenile, or whether they're up towards Alaska or down towards uh, Central America. So there is a lot of variation. Just, just uh, be, be cognizant of that if you're looking at other reference photos. Okay, we're just putting some final details. We're strengthening this wing because like I indicated in the video, it's coming towards us. It might even be six inches or a foot closer to us than the face. So we want to emphasize that. Uh, and again, just showing the overlapping of these feathers, even though they're a little blurred, again, we're going to emphasize that as the artist, we want to make it easier for our viewer to see that that wing is coming forward. <laughs> and I made a little movement, movement uh, markings there on the paper, strengthening those claws because those talons are super strong. And just shadowing a bit more on the undertail coverts. Just one more time, strengthen that line on the right wing to show the forearm coming forward. A little shadow under the neck. And we're just about done. And then we can share. Milana can share. So we're just about 
done. And so if anybody wants to share, uh, like Milana, I know your internet works, you've shared before. So I'm going to click on your uh, name. So if you're on, if you're only watching us on Facebook, I'm sorry, you can't share here, but you can certainly share with that hashtag on social media and on the Birds Caribbean website. You can share it probably in the comment section of this live video. So uh, if you are over here on Crowdcast, you can um, type your name in the chat box. And there's Milana. Hello, I, we haven't seen you for a while. I drew mine in a different position because I was a little mixed up by how short the legs are from its tail and all that stuff. That's okay. That's great. <laughs> Beautiful. How are you? Good. So I got much. a new mechanical pen. It's a mechanical pen and pencil. Oh, fabulous. And you used color pencil too. It looks like Milana. Yeah. I use my white pencil to smooth it all down. Oh, and sure. on art class, in a different class, I drew this. Beautiful. What species is that? I don't know. I didn't read, read what it was, but I just found a random book and started drawing. It looks tropical. Maybe like a parrot or something. It's a parrot. That's beautiful. Well, the people in the chat box are saying, wow, very nice job, Milana. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing. We hope to see you again soon. I wonder if it's an Amazon parrot. Oh, an Amazon parrot. Yeah, Amazonia, maybe. Bye. Hey, take care, Milana. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> She's one of my regular students. We, she hasn't gone live for a while. Okay, anybody else want to um, come on live and say hi before we wrap this up? Oh, Mike, Mike can share. Okay, great. I know Mike's video usually works. It's wonderful to have people come up on screen and say hello. I mean, you guys are my regular students, so you're braver about sharing. Maybe that'll bring out the uh, confidence in the others. Hey there, Mike, how are you today? I'm good, I'm sort of at work, so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, here, here we go, so. Fabulous, fabulous. Yeah, that is a tough bird for sure. It is. Well, I like to be challenging and a lot of you folks have been doing sketching with me for quite a while. And some of you have done this series. Remember we did the Northern Pintail and the American Kestrel, which itself was pretty challenging. So yeah. I want to just keep pushing you guys a little baby steps at a time to get better. <laughs> well, you are. Thank you. Good. Okay, great. Thanks. I got some other folks to share. So ciao. Okay, Joji, I know she's brave and uh, she can share. Let's see who else. Elaine and Cheryl say, good job, Mike. Lisa says, wow. Um, so make sure to put these. Oh, hello there. <laughs> oh, it's Joji. Hang on. Hi, Joji. <laughs> Something about this computer. I have to turn it around. I don't know. Anyways, hello. Hello, thanks for sharing. I love the crashing oh, waves in your background. Beautiful. I love the movement there. Thank you. And then yes. this morning I did the other one with you. The um, It's not done yet. This one. You're so oh, fabulous. Yes, um, for those of you who don't know, I'm doing a series um, on spooky nature topics. And so we did owls this morning with the gray horned owl. So you can find out about that on my Crowdcast page as well, that same page that we're broadcasting from now. So I just want to thank uh, everybody for uh, coming today. I want to thank Susan and Jacqueline and Joji and Anya and Elaine and Nancy and Cheryl and Mike and Diane and gee, who else was here? I want to thank Rhea and Christine uh, Jim and Eve, Catherine, Kira. Hi, Kira. How are you? Oh, you usually share. I'd love to have you share. Um, Dennis, nice to see you. And Nancy, Witha, great. So 